Good morning. Uh, it's great to see you here today. And it's really cool to see some Easter bonnets. Um, so, yeah, looking good. And it's Palm Sunday. And one of the words we know and associate with Palm Sunday is Hosanna. And it got me thinking this week as I selected the song Hosanna. What does Hosanna mean? Is it interchangeable with Hallelujah. Hosanna literally means in the Hebrew, God saves us. And it's a cry for help from oppressed people waiting for the king to deliver them. But Jesus wasn't the king they expected. He didn't come on a war horse with a sword to defeat the Romans, but rather he was a suffering servant riding a donkey who became a and our triumphant king. But Hosanna's meaning shifted... Yeah. 
patient long to have the words to sing. to save us. Over this Easter period, we ask for opportunities and the boldness to share the good news with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, It's time for the various children's programs. So back through the foyer is creche and um, ages to four, so one to four, and then primary age students out this way. Um, And you could admire their hats as they go past and say hello to someone nearby.
Well, good morning. It's great to see you all. It's great to see all the children heading off with all their hats. And uh, if you don't know what that's all about, uh, after church, there is going to be a hat parade outside on the basketball court. There's going to be all sorts of games and fun. Um, so please stick around. It's uh, not just for the, the kids and the parents. It's for the church family. So if you're wanting to stick around and see that happen, that's going to be lots of fun afterwards. Um, I know the kids are very excited. Before we get into any announcements, I just want to... Um, I want to first. I welcome Luke up to the stage. Uh, Luke, uh, over in our last church uh, quarterly ministry conference, he was uh, brought in as our uh, Two Sparrows Coffee Car Manager. And this morning, I just wanted to bring Luke forward and have a time of prayer. The the Great Commission um, in the Uh, in Matthew 28 tells us that uh, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and it says and surely I'll be there until the end of the age and I know for our heart for the coffee cart is that it is not just here but it is out into the world and it is seeing people um, being able to be brought in through the idea of coffee through the relationships and people getting to know Jesus. And I know that's uh, one of the reasons we said, yes, we'd love to have Luke as part of that because his heart is all about um, seeing others come to know Jesus as well. So, um, so this morning, um, I want to welcome Luke into uh, the, the space of Coffee Cart Manager. Um, if you've got any questions about how the van works or what it's about, about the ministry of the van, you can come and see Luke. Um, you can go see anyone that in, enjoys the, the space of the van as well. But Luke, I wonder if you're happy to, you're happy to uh, uh, just, uh, just, just give us just a, a couple of words about what you're excited about um, with the coffee van. Uh, the thing I'm most excited about is uh, reaching to the community and um, sharing the gospel, uh, the love of Christ, uh, what he's done in my life. Um, you know, the fact that Jesus died on the cross for all of us and not, not just uh, maybe in certain areas like only on a Wednesday night, but schools, um, anywhere the Lord le- uh, leads us, you know, um, I mean, everyone needs to know about the gospel, and I believe that uh, God has a plan for this cart, and it's not just uh, one night a week or two days a week, but um, I believe it goes far beyond that, and uh, yeah, that, that's it, I just want to answer the call wherever he takes us, and yeah. uh, be faithful to that, so... No, that's awesome. Thanks, Luke. It's a, it's a great vision, and um, it's lovely to see it start to come fruition. I know one of the things that you're really keen to do is to build teams of, of maybe baristas and people to go into different places, but even here on church on a Sunday morning. Um, so I'm not sure if there's any, anyone that might want to have a chat with Luke. Is there anything you want to say? No? Yeah, just, I mean, if you feel... Um, it's not so much about volunteers. I'm looking for people that uh, feel led, feel called, um, that have that prompting, um, you know, pray about it, and you don't have to be a brister. You can just be anyone that uh, is called. You know, if you wake up one day and thought, you know, think, you know, I have this this thing on my heart for the coffee cart. Um, you know, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, we'll train up anyone. Um, you can be in ministry. You can be in the cart itself. You can tow it. I mean, there's plenty of opportunities. Um, and just to be part of that that opportunity to see Christ at work in the community is, uh, I mean, it really is incredible sort of thing. So. Awesome. Well, thanks, Luke. And um, if, if the idea of, of even just exploring it is sitting in the back of your mind at the moment, come and speak to Luke afterwards. If you're thinking, I've always wanted to make a coffee, um, come and have a chat to Luke. Uh, I know we want to train some people up. That's on Luke's heart is to train some people up as well. So that might be something that you've never done before. Age is not a barrier. So please don't let age be a barrier. If you're much taller than Luke, um, you might struggle in the van. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but apart from that, um, we'd love to hear from you and um, Luke would as well. I'm wondering just um, if, if we can, anyone who's been involved in the coffee van ministry, in the um, Two Sparrows ministry, whether it be at schools, on a Wednesday night or wherever we've been, if you've been involved in that early process, I wonder if we come forward and we can pray for Luke. So anyone that's been a part of it, anyone that's been in on it um, from the very beginning, anyone that's prayed for it, any of our leadership team that might want to come forward as well, anyone that prays on a, come on, come on, come on. Anyone that prays on a uh, Wednesday night when the van goes out, please come forward um, and we'll, uh, we'll pray. It's wonderful. 
you guys want to come up? You're more than welcome to. Yeah, come on up. For sure. Wonderful. I've got the mic for a minute. All right, gather around. Um, I'll pray at the end. If anyone feels led to pray, um, I'll leave it open for a couple of minutes. But please pray. With, actually, I might get you to stand in with, uh, with us as we, as we pray. So I'm going to leave it open to whoever would like to pray from the front. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to get out there and witness to people on the street. We thank you for this cart, for the vision that Rod had to get a coffee cart going. We thank you for Luke stepping forward to manage it, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that over the next year we continue to see new people giving their hearts to the Lord as Matt did in his baptism, Lord. Amen. Dear God, I just thank you so much for your deep love for us. Um, God, I thank you for how you called Luke out of where he was at one point. And he looked up and he took your hand and you put his feet on solid ground. And now his life is a testimony for all that you can do for us, God. By your spirit only do we rely. We commission Luke into your hands, God. Your word says that Elijah was a man just like us. And he prayed that it would not rain and it did not rain for three and a half years. And again he prayed and it rained. The prayers of a righteous person are powerful and effective. We pray in Jesus' name that you make Luke powerful and effective in your strength, God. We ask that your kingdom be extended on this earth as it is in heaven through Luke's effort, his courage. Bless him and his family as he take this step. Lord, we know the enemy would seek to discourage him, make it difficult. We pray against that. And we stand with Luke. We stand with him. Bless him, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so, Lord, we do want to lift Luke to you. Lord, you've called him. You've called him out into this role. And, Lord, as he hears your voice, as he follows your direction, as he talks to people and as he um, shares his heart for you and for seeing others know you. I pray, Lord, that you use him in mighty ways, that he will be a blessing to those around him, that as the van goes out, that it will be a, a kingdom-building thing. It's not anything to do with a, a, a physical van or the actual people on the ground. It's to do with you and your kingdom, Lord. And we ask, Lord Jesus, that as you've brought Luke into this position, that he will be a kingdom-builder for you. So bless him. We thank you for the team of people that are around. And we ask, Lord, as a church, that we will really embrace Luke into this space. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, team. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Well, you'll, uh, you'll will notice that it's Palm Sunday, which means that Easter is really close. Um, it's uh, one week away and we have got uh, three services that happen over Easter. Um, we sort of call them one service over three days. So starting on Thursday evening at 7pm we have a Maundy Thursday uh, service. We're actually going to try something a little different. We're going to look at it from Peter's perspective um, as he uh, tells his story, not Peter, me, like Peter, scripture Peter, um, as he tells his story um, out on the basketball court, weather permitting. So we'd love to do that around a fire pit. So please come along. It'll be a little different, but it'll be, it'll be really cool. Um, so come along. That's 7 p.m. That's Thursday. 9.30 a.m. on Friday, Good Friday. We'll have some reflections here. And then 10 a.m. on Resurrection Sunday, next Sunday morning. So three services. It's great to come to all of them so you get that real sense of, of reflecting on the, the, the wholeness of this Easter week and weekend. Um, thank you to everyone who last week uh, gave a pledge for um, giving the uh, boot the debt. No, 
giving the debt the boot. Yep, get that one wrong most times. <laughs> I actually thought it through that time. I still got it wrong. Um, giving the, the, the debt the boot. Um, thank you for those that, who gave pledges. Uh, you, will, you will know that, um, that there is still time to give of your pledge. If you've got your pledge to give today, you can put that into the, um, the offering as it comes around. Or there are also what you'll find is some different coloured envelopes now on the seek and find table. Those envelopes uh, will help you to... Um, I think it's pink for the Give the Debt the Boot envelope. Um, there's a blue one for our community care um, offering as well, and there's a brown one that can be your every, every week offering. So if you want to get some envelopes so that you can place them into the offering for, and it'll go to the right space, you can do that as well. Um, we are still taking up those pledges for um, over the next month. Um, so if you haven't come prepared or you haven't thought through or haven't thought about how you can help make this, uh, this building debt that we've got... Um, diminish, um, please be praying and thinking about that as well. Um, one last announcement for now is on Wednesday, April the 3rd, which is not this week, it's the week after, <clears throat> there's going to be a worm lady here. Now, that's an interesting thing. So um, Sue is a worm lady, and she's going to come and talk to the people, so to whoever wants to be here, about worms, about how worms impact and help our gardens. So if you'd like to come down, she's going to be at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, the 3rd of April, um, all things worms. So if you have thought, well, how can worms help my garden? We've got a little worm thing. Um, has anyone got worms? <laughs> 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 um, uh, <laughs> I'm <gonna> sit down now. <laughs> um, um, okay, we're not going to recover from that one. <laughs> and let's pray. Um, okay, 10 a.m. Wednesday, the third of April. <laughs> Can we cut that bit? <laughs> Good. Let's just leave it there. <laughs> um, we're going to take up our offering and I'm going to have a sit down and then we're going to relax for a few minutes. Uh, let me pray. <laughs> Our Lord, we thank you for all the fun things that happen in church. Um, even having a worm lady come, uh, we give you thanks, Lord. Uh, we thank you that we have given, given so much and Lord... Um, we thank you that uh, you are able to give back. Uh, we're able to give back to you a little of what we have. So bless this money that are taken up. Bless those who are pledging. Bless uh, the pledges as they come in as well. Um, and may we um, build your kingdom through the, what is given. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.
Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thank you. Well, we are blessed to have uh, some of friends from uh, Second Chance Bangkok here today, along with Chris and J.D. McCartney, who have, um, we know and love um, as a church. We've been supporting them for a, a long time. Um, but I'm going to invite uh, Jody up, and she's going to share a little bit about what's been happening for Second Chance Bangkok. And um, then afterwards, we're going to invite some of the, uh, the team up, and we're going to pray for you. So thanks, Jody. Um, Yeah, thanks for having us. What a privilege to be back here among many uh, faces that have become friends over many years. Um, For those of you who don't know us, uh, back in 2007 we moved into um, Bangkok's largest slum community um, because we had a sense that God was inviting us to join with what he was already doing in that place. About 14 years ago, uh, God planted a little seed in in Chris and I uh, to kind of um, respond to one of the the biggest needs that we saw around us and in our neighbours was a lack of opportunity and a lack of employment and that each day was just a real struggle. And so we started to think, well, what might that look like? And so this little seed sort of began to grow and as we prayed and as we asked God to show us what that might look like... um, we decided to start a little second-hand shop. And it kind of grew from sort of an organic... People started giving us donations because they knew that we lived in a slum community and they said, hey, you could give this to your neighbours. And then we started thinking, well, how could we grow this to create opportunities for the people around us? And so that, that seed continued to grow and continued to grow. And um, from it, uh, a beautiful little... Um, thing called Second Chance Bangkok uh, was, was born. Um, fast forward to today. Um, three years ago, Chris and I made the decision to return to Australia. Um, lots of reasons and we just sensed that maybe God was saying it was time for us to, to come back, for our kids, uh, for our extended family. And it was, it was a real tearing of the heart because we had invested and we had, we had continued to water this, this plant, this, this seed that God had grown in us. And we'd been watering it and nurturing it. And it was really hard to let it go. Uh, since we came back in, uh, at the end of 2020, um, we've really since seen that God um, is faithful beyond what we can hope or imagine. Um, the seed that God planted in us is now a seed that is birthed in our team in Second Chance and that they are the ones that continue to water and continue to bring uh, life to this, the thing that God birthed in us. And over the last couple of, uh, this last week and for next week, um, Three of our leaders, and so they're going to come up in a, in a little bit, but um, the th- our three key leaders from Second Chance uh, arrived last Monday and we've been visiting other like-minded businesses and people who are doing things in communities that are um, seeing God's kingdom grow. And our hope and our prayer that over these cu- couple of weeks is that that little seed that was birthed in us, that is now something that these guys have chosen to take on, that going back, as they return back to uh, Bangkok next week, um, that that will just nurture and give them new ideas and and birth new hope for what God wants to do in the future. Um, Something that I I think we've we've really recognised is that it's not our work, it's not these guys' work, but it's God's work. And so we wanted to, because these guys are here, we wanted the opportunity and we're so grateful that Pete um, has given us this opportunity to just come and just say thank you because you guys have supported us for many, many years and you've supported the work of Second Chance for many, many years. And it's your investment, that partnership and that investment that has allowed us to be there, that has allowed us to, to invest in these guys 
that has allowed them to grow and to grow into their faith and to then step into leadership to then lead this into what God has in store for the future. And so we're all in it together. It's God's work. And so as we continue to support these guys from afar, um, we, we just wanted to say thanks. We wanted to say thank you to you guys for your faithfulness in praying for us, in giving, in um, praying for our team, um, and just and, and being partners in what God is doing in that community in Bangkok. And I wish we had an hour because uh, it, these guys have their own stories and beautiful stories of what God has done in and through them and what God continues to, to grow in them. And I can't wait to see what's going to happen in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, and we're just really excited about that. Um, after the service, we've got a, a table set up and they're all um, all been made. For those of you who have travelled with us, you know what that is, but some of you may not know. Um, you can have a look after the service, have a look at Second Chance Bangkok and you'll get a big, bigger picture and understanding of what we do. Um, but one of the projects is an upcycling project. So we take secondhand clothes and women who have skills in sewing or who want to learn how to sew um, create these amazing, beautiful things. And so that gives them a job and it gives them dignity and it gives them hope. And, and so we get the opportunity to sell these to, you know, anyone who, who is interested. But it's just one part of, of this, this beautiful picture of what God um, has grown at Second Chance. So come and, and, and I guess my encouragement is, doesn't matter if you're not interested in buying anything, but come and speak to Oi and Fern and Ern and ask them about themselves and get to know them. Because these guys are amazing and they're, um, they're a joy and they're, they're dear friends of ours. And we'd, we'd love you guys to um, get to know them as well. So, yeah, we're just really grateful. Thanks, Jodie. Can I um, uh, bring up Joy and... Uh, uh, Fern and Oi. Ern, Ern, Fern and Oi, sorry. Um, up, and Chris as well. Um, we'd love to be able to pray for you um, at this time. Um, for your time here in Australia, but also your time when you go back uh, to Bangkok and um, and do this ministry and mission um, there as well. And I'm wondering if we've got um, some of our mission team I know are here, um, unless Lynn might be out with the kids. Um, maybe not. Yeah, Lynn, can you come up? Is Pam here? That's Pam. No, Pam's not here this morning. Um, and maybe, uh, Jeanette, if you want to come up as well as the pastoral team, that'd be great. Um, and we just want to pray for you. Um, it is exciting for us to have you here. Um, we do pray for you um, already. We pray for you as a, as a team, a, past, a pastoral team, a missions team, as a church. Um, and we want to just encourage you um, that uh, we are encouraged by what you do. Um, so um, why don't we pray? Lynn, would you like to, to start, kick us off? Can I actually share a little story? So you would know the Fair Trader. Yes, yeah, yeah. so I volunteered there for a while. Bromwyn, yeah. So I volunteered there for a while and my daughter has worked there for six years and she's just finished there. Um, but I was there volunteering one Monday afternoon and your beautiful bags were in the shop and it's the denim ones, recycled. Brilliant, look out for those. Um, yeah, and uh, they were in the shop and whatever was hanging on the display thing outside the shop had been sold. So it's sitting there empty. And I thought, oh, do I have a, can I make this big decision what hangs out there? Anyway, I must have talked to Beck, I think, and said, and she said, yeah, look, put whatever you think. So I thought, these have been sitting here for a while. So I hung three or four out there. Within half an hour, three had gone. So I'm quite proud of that sale. <laughs> Anyway, sorry. Um, let us pray. <laughs> Dear Lord, we give, we give thanks for this wonderful ministry. Second chance, giving second chance to people and to items, Lord. But we do pray for the people who are making this possible, those in Australia, those in Bangkok, those around the world who are supporting. And we do particularly pray for the three Ladies that are here today, we pray that they have a really blessed time here in Melbourne over the Easter period and we give thanks that they could come.
We pray that it may be a really wonderful opportunity for growing the business, growing their faith, and just interacting with so many, Lord. Amen. It is great to have them along. Please do go out after the service and, and talk to them, but have a look at their what they have as well. Um, that would be wonderful. I'm going to invite the worship team forward um, as we sing a little more. The next two songs remind us of the hope that we have in Christ, that sin and death have been defeated. So let's stand and sing, Living Hope and Death Was Arrested.
reading comes from Mark chapter 11 commencing at verse 12. 
The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those that were bullying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. As he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of thieves. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. In the evening came, they went out to the city. In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree with it from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has with it. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt it in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold against anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Thanks, Helen for the reading. We'll get into that in a minute. Let's pray um, before we look into those scriptures. Our Lord and God, we give you thanks um, because you are good and your love endures forever. Our God, we have just been speaking about the freedom we find in you. And as we come to this holy week, as we gaze upon uh, the cross next week, as we Um, celebrate the empty tomb, God, we realize that we celebrate our freedom, our freedom that comes through knowing you as our Lord and Savior. And we want to pray, Lord, that this week we might have the space to stop and reflect on the such grace that you've given us, that we can be free, that we are forgiven, that we can live a life that reflects you. Our Lord, we do know that there are people who have been this week going through operations, who are recovering now, and Lord, we want to lift them to you. Our Lord, for those who are in hospital, who are are not doing so well, or those who are recovering, recovering, we ask that you be with them. Our Lord, we give thanks so much for the the seven baptisms last week and we pray a blessing over those seven people again. Lord, as they've gone through their week, as um, perhaps they've lived through the, the, the challenges that come after obedience has been made, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll keep them strong, that this will be a starting, uh, a refreshing point in their faith journey. And Lord, I pray for uh, those who uh, will be going on holidays over the school period, um, maybe taking a a few weeks off um, to get away. Lord, I pray for safety. I pray that you keep everyone safe on those roads. So Lord, as we come to your word, may you give us understanding. May you give us uh, an understanding of what you're speaking to us about through it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there's, um, there's nothing worse than when you get a, a, an apple that looks all right and then you bite into it or you open it up and it's just yuck on the inside. Or even, even there might be a worm or something. Is anyone... Oh, I'm not going to talk about worms. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> no more worms. Anyway, I, I, I had a Google through this week. I Googled um, what's not meant to be in your dinner. And this is a few of the things that came up. Someone received a phone with their pizza. So I don't know if you can see it real well in that top one. There's a, there's a telephone <laughs> in the pizza. Um, a frog ended up in the ice cream. That's a frog. 
that would be a shock, wouldn't it? Like, you imagine opening up your, your, your ice cream to, oh, that's a frog. More like a toad, it looks like. Um, a positive one, a pearl came in someone's oyster, which that would be pretty cool, unless you've opened the pearl and put it in your mouth and chewed on it and broke your tooth. Then you need the pearl to pay for your teeth. Um, the next one uh, along, this is, this is one of my favourites. Um, this guy, um, found, someone found a, a, a USB in, in a, a stick of, like, a, of meat and um, it was, uh, they put it into the computer and found it was a photo of a guy. There you go. <laughs> Imagine going to find him. Oh, I found a USB. <laughs> We generally look at something on the outside, don't we? And we presume that we're going to know what it's going to look like on the inside. That's what we'd presume, wouldn't we? Um, a pizza should be a pizza. That's what you should get. An ice cream shouldn't be frogs in it. That shouldn't be. Um, and if we put the, the spotlight onto us as humans, can, can we expect the same? If we were to put the x-ray machine to us and are we going to be representing on the inside what we declare, what we sing about, what we profess and confess as a person who reflects Christ on the outside? John John Stott um, put it this way. He said, how few of us live one life and live it in the open? We're tempted to wear a different mask and play a different role according to each occasion. This is not reality, but play acting, which is in essence, which is the essence of hypocrisy. Pretty hard hitting words, really. But that's the reality that we live in. We being those who know Jesus, because we watched these wonderful baptisms last week. We heard the testimonies, we celebrated them, we gave thanks to God for them. However, if you look deep into your heart this week, have you lived an ongoing, transparent life from, from sort of Wednesdays to Sundays, from Mondays to Sundays? Uh, do you live the same life when you come to church as when you go out to work? Or like the ice cream, do you have a pretty good looking on the outside, but something a little rotten on the inside? This morning, Jesus has a pretty good dig at the fruitless temple. And as we've heard through the reading that Helen shared with us, Jesus tells a story of a a fig tree that didn't bear fruit. And it seems harsh, but he curses this fig tree. And the next time they see the fig tree, it's totally dead. It's withered. What's that all about? And is Jesus just having a bad day and getting angry because he really wanted a fig and it wasn't there? What is it about? So we're going to unpack that a little bit as we explore love salvation through this Palm Sunday and Beyond story. So it is Palm Sunday, and it wouldn't be right if we didn't make note of how Jesus came into Jerusalem. At the start of Mark 11, which we didn't read in our reading, uh, it tells us a story of this triumphal entry. We have Jesus, he's coming into Jerusalem as king. But it's a vastly different king to what anyone was used to. The, the king was, was normally the war hero. He was, he was more, normally a, a lot of fanfare and a big horse and, and um, the one that flanked with music and, and, and much sort of greatness. If we go to the next slide, you'll see a contrast of the two. Um, I think of I think of when when King Charles um, was cor- the coronation of King Charles and and the the streets being lined um, in the London streets being lined. Did anyone watch that um, the coronation? And they come through the streets and there's just people cheering and waving. I'm thinking of that. And there was just this fanfare and this beautiful um, like uh, uh, cart that they were in. Yet Jesus comes from the other side of town, the hard side of town, the town where the hills are. And it's got to go down the hills. And he rides in on not this big war horse. He rides in on the totally opposite, a donkey. And people wave these palm branches at them. The palm branches often indicated peace in Israel. And they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It was a a celebration of the king that was to come, a cry out to save us. Although, can you imagine what the crowd was thinking? Save us, but you're on a donkey. I'm sure the other enemy's going to have a bigger horse than you. 
See, the contrast of, of Jesus' humble entry versus the Herod's powerful entry sets the scene what comes through the whole of Holy Week. Mark chapter 11, verse 11 says this, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts and he looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went to Bethany with the twelve. So Jesus comes in and the first port of call was when he got to Jerusalem was to go to the temple. It was late, but Jesus was here for a purpose. He was coming for a purpose. He wasn't on a sightseeing expedition. He was here like everyone else was gathering to, to, to celebrate Passover and to bring an offering to God at the temple. That's what they did. But there was something greater still at play. It was like Jesus was going out to scope out what was going on in the temple. And it's like he saw it and he said, come on, disciples, let's go and have some space. He wasn't impressed. You can imagine, however, the, the majesty of the temple. It was a place where people would come and they would worship God. And from the outside, this temple was majestic. It was an engineering feat. It would have been packed with people. There would have been people everywhere. People had come to bring their Passover offerings. It really would have been a spectacular sight, a real buzz. Like when you go to um, the Queen Victoria Market and there's, there's people everywhere and there's a real buzz around where you can get the meat samples. Um, does anyone else do that? I love those. <laughs> but it was, this, this temple was all of the grandeur. You couldn't see grandeur like that anywhere else. Outside, it looked the part, but inside, it was rotten. So Jesus seems to go to his place where he's staying for the night, and he comes back the next day, and it was a big day. It was this triumphal entry had happened. The Passover was being prepared. They visit to the temple. It was a big day. But now we start at the start of this reading in chapter 12 that we had, uh, chapter 11, verse 12. It says this. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, so it was alive, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. So Jesus has come into Jerusalem again from where he stayed and he's hungry. He sees a fig tree and he goes and sees if it's got fruit, but there's no fruit. So he seems to get mad and curse the tree. You won't make any, any fruit anymore. This is the only miracle that Jesus does where he destroys something rather than builds something up. The only miracle that he does that destroys. So what's going on? What's actually happening in this space? The tree's alive. The tree, it doesn't say the tree's dead. The tree is alive. It's got leaves on it. So it might have, to have a good chance it's got fruit on it as well. In that, in that time, it probably wasn't fig time, but apparently there's two different types of fig trees um, is what I was reading, and, and some of those trees could still have figs on it even at that stage. However, Jesus finds no fruit on it, and he gets mad or seemingly mad, and he curses it. Taken on its own, it can cause a problem understanding this. But if we consider the experience of the temple, and if we sandwich the fig tree in between two temple stories, we start to get an understanding and idea of what Jesus might be saying regarding God's judgment of the people of Israel and of this fruitless temple. God's given the nation of Israel life, and the temple was the heart and soul of the community of the worshipping people. Whilst it still looks good on the outside, it seems quite sick on the inside. A scholar James R. Edwards says of the fig tree experience, he says, The leafy fig tree, with all its promise of fruit, is as deceptive as the temple, which despite its religious commerce and activity, is really an outlaw's hideout, a den of thieves. And the curse of the fig tree is a symbol of God's judgment of the temple. So after Jesus curses a fig tree, it breaks scene and we go into Jerusalem and straight back into the temple. And it's here that we get this image of Jesus coming in and tearing apart the temple, throwing over the, the tables, making a big scene. You can imagine it, can't you? You can imagine the noises that would have been around when the money goes flying everywhere. Kids looking at it and going, oh yes, I'm going to grab some. We can imagine the birds fluttering and flying as the cages fall to the ground and they fly away. 
It's the busiest time of the year. People have flocked. So there's people everywhere. People have flocked to Jerusalem. So you can imagine people going, what's going on? What's all the noise? People gathering around a crowd. Jesus isn't allowing people to walk through even with the merchandise. What's going on? How do we understand this outburst? If we look at it just as an isolated story, we might miss the full meaning of it. That's what's going on. So to fully understand, we need to understand the temple in Jesus' time. Now, the temple was a temple that was rebuilt by King Herod. He, um, he, he rebuilt the temple that had been um, ruined uh, earlier. And inside was this inner part of the temple that was for the Levitical priests. That was their space. They went in and they made their offering. There was an outer court, and the outer court was segregated into different various places. Some for Gentiles, so the non-Jews, they, they were allowed in, but there was a space specifically for them, um, a space for women and a space for for the Jews, the men Jews. Now, it was in the Gentile courts that most of this place, this part took place. It was this large open area where people bought and sold things. Each year, people would come from all over the nation, all over the, the place for the Passover, and just as the disciples did. So the disciples came from outside and came in. And each year, they would come to bring their offering in the temple courts, to bring a sacrifice. And so if you're traveling a long distance, the last thing you wanted to do was having to carry maybe a, a tied up uh, live animal with you. It was difficult to travel like that. It was inconvenient to travel like that. So to combat this, people would set up stalls in the, in the courts of the Gentiles to sell animals that people could buy for the purpose of sacrifice. It made sort of sense. It made sense that as a trading place, there, were, there was somewhere for these people to grab and buy their sacrifices. However, the issue was that, that when travellers went to buy their sacrifice, the, the, the tourism tax was applied. You know what tourism tax is, if you've ever been overseas. Um, if you've ever travelled, you know tourism tax. Um, we went to St Mark's Square in Venice. Has anyone been to St Mark's Square? Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. We went there in um, mid-2000, uh, probably about 2006 or so, and um, this beautiful 8th century uh, church um, is there at St. Mark's Basilica. It's stunning and a wonderful place to visit. But we went there and there was music playing. It was really lovely, and we went and had a coffee um, in one of the shops around St. Mark's Square. Now, this is, so we're going back nearly 20 years, so finances are different. And we sat down and we got our hot chocolates, and each hot chocolate was 10 euros. 10 euros for a hot chocolate. Now, that's $16 in 2006. <laughs> that was a lot of money for a hot chocolate. We savoured the hot chocolate, didn't we? It was a lot of money for a hot chocolate. We felt totally ripped off. But that was the price you paid for being at St Mark's Square, having a coffee, listening to the music there. It was utterly ridiculous. Um, similar sort of deal when you go to a concert or anything like that. And so you, you get the feeling this was happening in the, in the temple. And this is why Jesus got so angry. They were doing the same thing. These people were coming from afar, needing to buy something, and then getting totally ripped off. They weren't sitting down for a hot chocolate, but they, was, they were actually trying to get the sacrifice that they needed. They needed that sacrifice so they could worship God. They were taking, the, the, the sellers were taking advantage of the people who had no other option. The other problem that occurred was that these Jews were coming from all over the place, and generally they may have different currency. Um, so to come in and buy something, they'd have to change their currency. That's why the money changes are there, and Jesus overturns the money changes. But it's an, an important part of the process that people have to come in, exchange their money so they can buy uh, the sacrifice with the right currency. So they were important. So Jesus didn't get angry because the money changes were there. That was a necessity. When we went to Bali last year, we were quite wary of the money changes because all, all, all of them had different levels of, um, of uh, the taxes, I suppose, or the, the, the different currency changes. And you're never quite sure. And you always hear the horror stories of, of how they pass your money over and they slip one or, one or two notes back in their pocket. And we went to one and, and I wasn't overly confident because it was sort of out the back of a place. And I gave my money over and they, um, they gave it all back and they counted out in front of you. And I walked away. I think we were at least one note short, at least one note, if not two. They ripped us off. Now, it wasn't heaps of money, to be fair, but they ripped us off. 
And perhaps that was what was going on in the temple as well. Sleight of hand, a, a higher tax, whatever it might have been. Jesus wasn't happy with how they were operating. He used the term a den of thieves, indicating that they were profiting through the outrageous exchange rates that they had. There was personal gain at the expense of those who didn't have any other option. The temple was designed as a place to worship God alone, and it's become a place where people were gaining for their own gaining their money for themselves. So Jesus quotes Isaiah 56. He says that um, it's not written, my house will be called a a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. So Isaiah 56, it starts out uh, 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 opposite to what's happening in the temple courts. It says in Isaiah 56, verse 1, it says, Maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Maybe Jesus was remembering this because he says, what should we, because Isaiah is saying, what should we do? We should do what is right. And then Jesus quotes verse 7 of Isaiah 56, that burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. Whose? Well, verse 6 says, foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord and minister to them, others who have come in to know the Lord, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. All who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who, who hold fast to my covenant. Now, this was not just a message for the chosen ones. This was a message to all nations who have come to know the Lord. And Jesus picks up on it. God's people were not making it accessible for all people to come to the altar of God. They were hindering for the sake of their own profit. And Jesus is calling them out and says, no way. You're not going to do that. That's not what the temple is for. This seems to be the real thing that just tips the religious leaders over the edge, doesn't it? In verse 18, we hear that they're now plotting to destroy him. And destroy, when we read that destroy, we're here and kill. Um, not just destroy, kill. Not, it's just a reputation thing. They're actually out for his life. Why? Because they heard him and they feared him. Why did they fear him? Because he was turning heads now and perhaps making a bit of sense as to why the the religious leaders were were making a a bit of a farce of the whole system. We don't know how long the religious leaders in the temple have been profiting from these exchanges. We don't know what was going on um, for for however long. But what we do know is once these actions of Jesus happened, the leaders then had a choice. They could go, you know what, we've missed the mark We've turned this temple into a place where actually we should have had it as a worship to God. They could have chosen that or they could reject it. And that's indeed what they did. They rejected Jesus. And for us it's a daily decision as well, isn't it? To follow Jesus, choosing to follow Jesus rather than the the comforts that the world bring to us. To, to, to release the need of approval to our bosses or superiors or even our peers, understanding that true approval comes through Jesus. It's a choice we need to make. The choice to let go of the self-imposed reins and hand them over to Jesus and say, every day, Jesus, I'll follow you. But for the religious leaders of the time, they didn't just want to, they didn't want to understand that. So Jesus takes us back to the fig tree, verse 20 of Mark 11. In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from its roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. The cursed non-fruit-bearing tree is dead, totally dead. Now, Jeanette uh, Shevchenko, she took a photo of her fig tree, um, which had withered. And I've got a, a, do I have a photo of it? Yeah, I do. Um, well, that was the one that was not withered. Did I put a photo of the withered one? Oh, I missed the photo of the withered one. Oh. And the, the withered one is just totally dead. It's got no, no leaves or anything on it anymore. Um, so it, it, it was a pretty sick sort of sight, very sort of different to the one that we just had up there. Um, totally dead. But Jesus shows, uh, goes back to the fig tree and they see it. 
And it's a pretty telling example of the judgment that is being placed on the temple and the religious leaders. The purpose of the fig tree is to bear fruit. And the fig tree didn't do its purpose. Maybe those who were sort of following Jesus around from afar was watching what was happening with this fig tree. They may have twigged in their mind back to Jeremiah who shared a similar sort of prophecy. It says in Jeremiah 8, Are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush, so they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down when they are punished, says the Lord. I will take away their harvest, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the vine. There will be no figs on the tree, and their leaves will wither. What I have given them will be taken from them. Jeremiah is mourning the sin of the people of God. And as you walk through the start of Jeremiah 8, it's pretty scathing until he gets to verse 13. It says, there will be no figs on the tree and the leaves will wither like Jeanette's poor tree. Jeremiah spoke into a nation that wasn't willing to listen. Jesus says, I'm not going to speak about it. I'm actually going to show you what happens. I'm going to show you in real time. The withered tree was an allegory to speak to the disciples about about God's judgment when people aren't working towards them. The Jewish people were so interested in looking like the people people of God rather than being the people of God. And eventually, fruitless trees die. But the triumphal entry reminds us that there is a king who is worthy of shouting, Hosanna, save us, we pray. The Messiah riding in on a donkey was going to save in a very different way to what everyone had expected. He was to die to release us, not from the Roman rule, but to release us from the grip of sin. He was to die so that our inadequacy was made complete. He was to die so that there may be fruit from the fruitless trees, that it not be made attributed to an individual, but that glory would go to God. So Jesus cursing this fig tree is a stark reminder to us that as inheritors of the kingdom of God, we're actually to bear fruit. We're to be fruit bearers. Jeremiah warned of the, of the, the sin of the nation that was destroying them and the, the withered fig tree. Jesus shows us the destruction of this fig tree that wasn't bearing fruit, sandwiched in between these two temple stories. And so we're reminded then of our own lives, how we are to live, yet not in our own strength that we live, but in God's strength. It is through the faith uh, faith in the Messiah who came in on a donkey, people waving branches, shouting, Hosanna, save us. Imagine if each person who claims Christ as Lord lived in an abundant way that bore fruit. God's kingdom would be abundant with fruit. It will be a great day in my prayer for us as a church that we will be a fruit-bearing church. We can start to see it. We see the fruit starting to bear We hear the stories and the testimonies. We see people praying. We have connect groups meeting and studying the word. We can see it. My prayer is it continues to grow and blossom into something wonderful. Let's pray. Our Lord and God, uh, it's a tough story to hear that, Lord, that uh, your son Jesus would would, um, destroy. But, Lord, there's a reality that when we are not bearing fruit, we are not fulfilling our purpose. So, Lord, may we not be like those in the temple, but may we be those who want to worship you with all we have, that our fruit may be seen to all the people that we mean. We give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Pete. Um, Our final song, Be Thou My Vision, is just always that reminder that we see things the way that God wants to see things in our lives rather than our own. So let's stand and sing Be Thou My Vision.